What's up guys? We're back and this week I was wrong. Let's talk about it. But first, like, subscribe, comment, follow the algorithm. So one of the things I get a lot of people asking me is, hey Lane, what stuff have you changed your mind on over the years? And the answer is a lot of stuff. Some people will say Lane is dogmatic and he just says the same things over and over. That's not true. What you have to understand is I have developed my conclusions about various things in research over decades of study and examining scientific research. So for me to change my opinion on something that I feel strongly about is probably gonna require a lot of evidence. Now, if I don't have a very strong opinion on something, it's not gonna require that much evidence, but it's gonna be proportionate to whatever I feel like the current scientific evidence and consensus of that evidence says. So there's gonna to have to be a shift over time in the consensus in order for me to really shift my opinions unless I feel like the consensus is wrong, which I have at times. But again, that's gonna require some pretty high amounts of evidence. But let's talk about some of the things I've changed my mind about. And two things I changed my mind about early on in my scientific career or bodybuilding career, one of them being fasted cardio and the other one being high fructose corn syrup. But let's talk about it. When I first got into bodybuilding, you know, the consensus was you do fasted cardio because if you do fasted cardio, you're gonna be burning stored body fat, but if you do fed cardio, you're gonna be burning the food you just ate. Sounds good, sounds legit. But like many things, it did not hold up to the litmus of science. Indeed, if you do fasted cardio, you will have higher rates of fat oxidation compared to doing cardio after feeding. However, in studies where they look at equating calories and equating work and having people eat beforehand or eat afterwards, there is no difference in the actual loss of body fat. And that is because the loss of body fat is a balance between the rate of oxidation as well as the rate of fat storage. The other reason is when you do fasted cardio, you are eating less beforehand, you're eating nothing beforehand. But by default, your feeding window is now shortened and you're going to eat more during the rest of the day. So yes, your rates of fat oxidation during exercise are higher, but they're actually gonna be lower the rest of the day because you're eating more during that time period. Compared to fed cardio, you're eating maybe first thing when you get up and then you're doing cardio. That is widening that feeding window, which means yes, you burn less fat during the exercise itself, but then you're burning more fat the rest of the day because you're eating less the rest of the day compared to the other group that did fed cardio. On the whole, it doesn't appear to be a big difference. So that's one thing I changed my mind about. As far as high fructose corn syrup, I thought high fructose corn syrup was the devil circa 2004, 2005. Look at all these rodent studies showing it increases de novo lipogenesis, et cetera, et cetera. And then a bunch of studies came out in human randomized control trials where they showed that when you replaced high fructose corn syrup with other forms of carbohydrate and kept calories the same, it did not make a difference on pretty much anything. Now, that's not saying high fructose corn syrup is good for you because it's easy to overconsume. Tends to be in sugar sweetened beverages, which are not satiating and people tend to overconsume them. So I'm not saying high fructose corn syrup is a good thing, but on a calorie per calorie basis, it is not fattening compared to other carbohydrates. What other things have I changed my mind about? Branch chain amino acids. So I was a big proponent of branched chain amino acid supplementation for probably about 15 years, from say circa 2002 till about 2017. Why? Well, my PhD specifically was in protein metabolism and spent a lot of time studying the BCAAs, specifically leucine, and much of our research was looking at leucine's effects on skeletal muscle protein synthesis. And I probably had a strong bias because of that. And I just liked consuming flavored BCAA powders during my training for whatever reason. And I was sponsored by a company that produced a BCAA supplement. So I definitely had a bias. And I myself had a supplement company called Carbon Supplements back circa 2015 to 2017, where one of our products contained branched chain amino acids. So I was fully invested in this. However, over time, the weight of the evidence convinced me that branched chain amino acid supplements, while they may have a small benefit for reducing delayed onset muscle soreness and recovery, they do not in isolation build muscle. If you're eating enough total protein, it doesn't appear you need a BCA supplement or it doesn't appear that a BCA supplement is helpful. If you're somebody who's a vegan or you consume a very low quality diet, Adding BCAAs on top of that may help improve that protein quality, but again, you could just get it from actual protein if you wanted. And so when I released my new line, Outwork Nutrition, we did not have any BCAAs in our products because I could no longer support the use of BCAAs 
in supplements because the evidence just wasn't there. Darn ethics. If only I could not be so ethical, maybe I could make some more money. I'm gonna take a class from Liver King. Maybe he can help me out. Next thing I changed my mind on, LDL cholesterol. So back circa 2005 to probably 2015, I was of the opinion that LDL cholesterol didn't matter so much. It was more about the LDL to HDL ratio, inflammation and particle size. And then a bunch of Mendelian randomization trials came out basically showing that over the course of a lifetime, there is a linear effect from the amount of LDL you are exposed to and your risk of heart disease. Additionally, if you look at the research data, when they give drugs that lower LDL, it lowers the risk of heart disease. But if you give drugs that raise HDL, it does not lower the risk of heart disease. Now having a high HDL is a good thing because high HDL indicates metabolic health, but even at high levels of HDL, if you stratify people with high levels of HDL with either low LDL or high LDL, but also high HDL, people with low LDL and high HDL still have lower rates of heart disease compared to people with high HDL and high LDL. So again, that's where it comes into being an independent risk factor. And the same holds true for inflammation. If you have low levels of inflammation, that's good, but people with low levels of inflammation and low LDL still have lower rates of heart disease than people with low levels of inflammation and high LDL. I got convinced that LDL actually was an independent risk factor for heart disease, even though I had said for years that I didn't think it was. Then finally, intermittent fasting is something I changed my mind on. I used to say, don't practice intermittent fasting. You need to be eating at least every three to five hours if you're interested in maximizing your rate of muscle building because we know that the duration of muscle protein synthesis is only like three to four hours. And so if you're going long periods of time without spiking that, it's gonna be a detriment to you. When it comes to the types of intermittent fasting, at least the popular 16-8, where you're fasting for 16 hours and eating during an eight hour feeding window, studies by Grant Tinsley showed that people who fast for 16 hours and eat during an eight hour feeding window appear to get the same gains as people who eat continuously. But there's a few caveats to this. They had their subjects train during the feeding window and they had them eat three protein containing meals. So a lot of people who intermittent fast aren't being very conscious of how they distribute their protein when they have that feeding window and they're training during the fasting window. Now we don't have any direct comparisons to say what you should do, but at least based on these studies by Dr. Tinsley, it may be a good idea that if you're gonna do a 16 8 intermittent fasting, that you train during that feeding window and you try to get at least three high quality protein meals. So there's a lot more stuff I've changed my mind on, but these are some of the major things. And I thought it'd be useful to point it out for you guys to show that I'm not dogmatic. If I see enough evidence, I will change my mind. And hopefully that gives you more confidence that when I plant my flag really strongly, it's because there's a lot of evidence to support that. If you're looking to support a supplement company that is no BS and is always gonna follow the evidence, make sure you check out my line, Outwork Nutrition at outworknutrition.com. We sell supplements that help you train harder, recover faster, build a little bit more muscle, and perform better in the gym. And we think you guys will love them. High quality, very, very good flavors. And I would love it if you guys check it out. So click the links in the description, go check it out.